Good evening, all. A full house. Thank you all. Quarter. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to dive straight into the agenda. Um, we're waiting for Andy, but he's in, I'm right thinking he's in, a, in another meeting and we'll come in as we get to that point, which, which is good. Um, apologies to Donna. I received apologies from Councillor Butterworth and Councillor Marshall. Thank you. Uh, I've got no announcements or urgent business. Uh, declaration, I've got no declarations of interest. Anybody else? Just a courtesy declaration of interest. Yeah. Just a courtesy declaration of interest. I'm an ex-fire safety officer and as such receive a pension from Greater Manchester Fire Service. Thank you for that. Um, minutes have we all... Oh, sorry. Apologies. Uh, I'd just like to say I'm an ex-fire service member too and I receive a fire service pension. Any, any more? No, great. Okay, to plough on. Uh, minutes uh, of the previous meeting, 20th of February. Have we all had a copy? Have we all perused them? Any comments? Any changes? So can we, would someone like to propose those? That was a nod. That was a good nod, that, and a second. And great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and then straight into um, response to the Kerr's late report. Uh, Dawn, do you want to put some background into this? Should we pause? Claire will, Claire's just going to. I think you can introduce it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the covering paper that you have sort of introduces the Kurzweil report, which I hope that you've had the chance to to look at the full report, um, because obviously we. we we couldn't in incorporate it with this, so we've just put the, the part that refers to the Fire and Rescue Service, and we'll talk about that today. Um, but the actual report itself is a very balanced report, and it covers all aspects of the incident at the arena. It looks into the preparedness in advance. It looks at the, um, what occurred that evening, and also the immediate days after that in which all emergency services were very much uh, in evidence working with the counter-terrorism unit in the, the days following the, the bombing. Um, but obviously your, your interest tonight is on uh, what the Fire and Rescue Service did and particularly what it intends to do in the future. With that, I'll... Dawn's just doing the introduction, just fleshing it out. It's not really got to the, the bones of it yet. Okay. Um, as I say, what your interest is, is what has happened since then, and how can you be re reassured that the, the same events would have a, a different outcome? Um, I think I'd like to start by... Um, confirming that Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service did its own debrief almost immediately after the arena. And many of the issues that are identified in the Kerslake report, we'd already identified ourselves and we'd put actions in place. So some of the, uh, the issues are around the, the misunderstanding of the messages that came through to the Northwest con Control. So the uh, messages that came through to that control room mentioned the word bomb and therefore the control room used the uh, the action card related to bomb and actually that was designed for one that hadn't exploded not one that had exploded hence the first action that actually added to a chain of actions which led to the delay uh, in mobilizing so the first action was to look at uh, that card which said mobilize, i.e. send uh, a NILO officer, so that's a, a special, specialist officer, to the scene to determine whether we need to send resources. Now, of course, that would be perfectly reasonable if it was an unexploded bomb, but because it had exploded, that was 
in effect, the wrong action at that time. That, of course, has been immediately changed, and uh, any uh, explosion that has happened, uh, we would send resources, as we would actually to any other incident, where immediately uh, the control room sends, whether it is one or two fire engines, they assess what is going on, and then they call for additional support. So I'm happy to talk more about that in a minute. There's also the, the issue around uh, national guidance and policy, which had been practiced and exercised uh, in, um, in, in real time, but actually when it came to being in the face of a, a no-notice uh, no event like this, actually the flaws became apparent with that guidance. And in fact, uh, that has now been taken up at a national level, the guidance around the use of the, the NILO officers. Uh, and today, the National Fire Chiefs Council have put forward a statement basically redefining the role of the, the NILO officer and confirming that they do not take charge of an incident they are actually a, a resource to be called on by the incident commander. So you can see that actually the ramifications of the Curse 8 report goes much further than Greater Manchester and is certainly influencing policy uh, within uh, the UK Fire and Rescue Service. I'll stop at that and let... Thanks very much, uh, Dawn. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, well, just to, to follow on from what the uh, interim chief is saying, um, I and obviously the first thing I would say is that um, there can't be a perfect response to a, an incident of this kind. There just can't. Um, it's always going to be the case that you need to take an honest look at, at things. Uh, if you're then to learn, improve, and make the public safer, as a result, and I think that's all, all of our obligation, every single one of us as elected representatives and public servants in Greater Manchester, we've constantly got to be asking ourselves what, what more can we do to improve public protection and public safety. Um, so really that, that was the reason why uh, the Kerslake uh, review was commissioned in the, in the first place. A difficult thing to do, but I would say the right thing to do, and I feel strengthened in that belief, um, having received uh, Lord Kerslake's uh, report. You know, rightly, we should always champion what we're doing in Greater Manchester, but we should never get into a position where we're so kind of ready to pat ourselves on the back that we're not also, also prepared to look ourselves in the mirror at times and say, well, you know, did we have everything right and could we have done something better? And obviously, a, a process like this is challenging because of that particularly given the rawness of events here and you know, how, how difficult it was for everybody. But I, I would still say the, 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 right, uh, the right thing uh, to do, because my experience um, working on other um, uh, tragedies, notably Hillsborough, is that actually if you don't provide answers early on, the call for them only will increase and actually get more difficult later down the line. Um, and the way that we asked um, Lord Kerslake to approach this review by putting the views of families at the very heart of it, I think helps set everything off on the right foot. Because obviously we've got the inquest to follow and the inquest will get in, into more detail on many of these issues. But again, I think we've kind of just started the process in the right way, on the right foot with those most affected at the forefront of our, of our minds. Just to remind uh, the committee that it was a call from frontline firefighters, actually, that I responded to in the days after the attack to, to say there would be an independent review, which eventually became the Kerslake Review. There was stuff you may remember in the Manchester Evening News and elsewhere voicing this concern around um, the way in which events unfolded and the lack of fire service attendance. You know, that, that's where it originally uh, began. And, and perhaps then no surprise that when it looked in detail at, at, um, at what happened, um, there was um, then questions about um, the fire service. Its response on that night, but as you will have read in the report, broadening then looking into, into the culture 
of Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service and um, whether or not that, that culture um, was, uh, was right. Um, I have to say the Kerslake report in and of itself was not the only thing that had been brought to our attention in the last year. I'm talking in terms of myself and the Deputy Mayor um, with regard to you know, the, the morale, if you like, within, within the fire service. So colleagues will remember going back around 18 months ago, we had the whole debate around shift patterns and reforming shift patterns, and that had led to a very um, difficult um, uh, situation where there was a redundancy notice and you know, there'd been a you know, response from staff, and that, that had been uh, difficult. Um, we had re received concerns, the Deputy Mayor and I, last year around um, fire service staffing levels at the front line. Um, and I'd picked that up and I did some work shadowing myself with, with frontline staff at Bolton um, Fire Station. So then there were issues around the um, IRMP that were raised with us and we, we looked at that. We took a decision around um, overtime because it had been brought to our attention last year that there was a shortage of what, 60 vacancies in terms of frontline firefighters uh, and, a, and a situation where overtime was only being paid at normal time rather than any addition. So the vacancies were not being backfilled by overtime arrangements which would have uh, covered that. So I suppose the point I'm building to here is we'd been aware of a growing number of issues related to the fire service that, that were affecting morale internally. Um, then there was the, you know, the whole question of the, uh, the former chief um, uh, leaving his post. Um, and then the Kerslake re review. So there's been a whole kind of series of things that have built to this point where we've basically been asked uh, or it's been recommended to us by the Kerslake review to conduct a much deeper review of the, the service, um, its leadership, its culture. And that is what, what, what is now about to, um, to, to, um, to happen. Um, uh, without necessarily going to, to all of the, the detail, or I'm happy to, of course, answer questions. I, I think that a, a simple way to put it, and it's no disrespect to, to, um, to, to any member of, of, of management or senior positions within our fire service, there is quite a divide between the front line and those in uh, more senior positions, right? Whatever the reason for that, and I'm not necessarily rights and wrongs, and many of us maybe could go back to that dispute of 2003, four, where there was a, you know, a, a rift, I think opened up at that time, that probably has never properly been, been bridged, actually, if, if we're honest. Um, the reality is that that is still there and it's not, not been closed. And the review, I think, has to get into, um, into um, that whole issue and look uh, at how we bring people back together in a, in a positive way. But I would say probably kind of responds to the central criticism of the Kerslake Review, which is around a fire service that perhaps is less looking at the rule book and more looking at what's out there in front of it and, and a more empowered front line that is able to respond um, in, in a different way than perhaps they feel they're able to at the moment. People often talk of a military style um, culture within the fire service. And it is, it, it is you know, the Kerslake Review itself said um, that the culture of the three emergency uh, services, um, ambulance, police, fire is different. Each is different. They're not necessarily saying that it's wrong different. They, they just said different for a whole host of reasons. And I think if you think about the fire service, the nature of what they do means that you can't turn up at a, an incident and have every, every person for themselves freelancing and doing what, you know, you've got to have a structure, you've got to have a, uh, you know, a, a very clear command uh, structure. Um, but there is a sense that sometimes that kind of carries on into everything the fire service does and, you know, the front line of pretty much done to as opposed done with and uh, that becomes a bit a bit of a, a bit of an issue so I, I mean actually rather than this becoming quite a negative 
process where everyone's, you know, we don't want it to be that. What we want this to be is a kind of moment where, you know, we kind of try and draw a bit of a line. Let, let I hear from people what's good about Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, and there's plenty of it, lots of it. Uh, and let's really celebrate the good, but then also give people an, a, a chance to speak freely about what needs to change. And then um, hear that, and if we can, act, act upon it. Um, I'll just give you one thing that, that I think you know, is, in, is indicative of how things aren't quite right um, and have you know, perhaps not been changed to, to bring the, the, the fire uh, service up to modern standards. And it's a simple point, but it, it's felt very keenly at the front line, and that's annual leave. So at the moment, annual leave is centrally organised, so people don't choose their annual leave, they're given their leave from a kind of centralised system that... that um, hands uh, dates uh, out to people and I think anybody would say that that's in a modern service that's not necessarily the best way to get the best out of, uh, of people and it's just a small I suppose it's an example of how you know the perspective of those on the front line seems quite different to those uh, perhaps in the in back office or in management positions and it's how we can kind of make some quite simple but potentially quite profound changes to the way the way the service operates i think there is a case one of my early kind of observations would be to empower people lower down the organization particularly at station manager level and you know let let there be more devolution of power if you like uh, that way but these are these are just um, these are just just early thoughts and i go into the review without any you know predetermined outcome of of how uh, how we might change things what I want is for the voices of people at every level of the organisation to be heard without any sense of comeback or recrimination, for people to have their say and have their say very directly, make it a moment of, you know, a positive moment in the end for Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service where we can kind of say, you know, we are where we are, let's hear what people have got to say, let's, let's respond in a pragmatic way and then also put in place, you know, a, a strong recruitment which Dawn has already um, um, put in place, um, a strong recruitment campaign, um, have a, uh, an approach to uh, fire cover that is, that is fair to all parts of Greater Manchester and really kind of have a, an openness and transparency ab about that. Um, and yeah, if, if we need to talk again to the workforce around shifts and how they work and when the right time to have people on shift is, you know, and, and you know, dealing with those issues, or, or equally, I think the very successful pilot that the GM Fire and Rescue Service brought through around emergency medical response, is there a way in which we can come back to that issue and see if it can be done on a more permanent basis, but in a way that recognises some of the concerns that the front line had about, about the way that was being done. So there's, uh, there's a lot more I could say. I won't at this stage, Chair, because I think obviously colleagues may want to, 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 to ask um, uh, questions about about where we where we're going to go from here, but um, I um, I would just really want to stress that I think this if we all go into it with goodwill with an open mind, I think this in the end can become a very positive uh, exercise um, uh, for the Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you for that, Andy. Um, now, for the, com for the committee, I'm conscious we don't want to unpick the Kerslake report. We're, con we're concerned with going forward and our uh, assurances that whatever ends up in place or is in place, actually, to be fair, because it's an instant response when it's required, what is in place is, is suitable and, and, it, and it simply doesn't happen again because we are effectively the scrutiny of, of that. So just be conscious that we're not about analysing the issue when, when you're asking your questions. Um, Yvonne, you were first to indicate. So. I was interested to hear what you were saying about the uh, gap, if you like, between um, the leaders of the fire service and the front line. And we had a very useful meeting with Leon Parks, two of us on a task and finish a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we actually raised this issue and said, as far as we know, we are the scrutiny committee for the fire service now, yeah? Correct? And the old fire committee um, is advisory at the moment and may disappear, I don't know. 
But we did feel that uh, we tend to meet the great and the good here, don't we? Um, you know, it's all leaders and managers who come and present themselves to us, which is great. But we did think maybe there was um, a case for having the voice of the rank and file as well at our scrutiny, the FBU representative or whoever, you know, um, if that could be arranged because we want to hear it from the horse's mouth, don't we? You know, and the morale issue is a big one, very big, isn't it? These are very important people. And uh, it's like the rank and file everywhere, you know, they do the actual work, don't they? And, you know, the, the leaders don't really do any work, do they? They just sort of sit in offices and eat oranges or whatever. But, no, seriously, we do need to hear the voice of the um, rank and file, yeah. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a comment to uh, the Mayor and uh, the Chief Fire Officer. Two meetings ago, the Chief Officer um, explained the move to um, the emergen emergency medical response that the Fire Brigade were developing, and I was a wholehearted supporter of that, and it was a really good move, and it was very encouraging to see the Brigade having the wisdom and the vision to broaden the skills of a very skilled workforce anyway. And I think what was so disappointing as an ex-fire officer for me myself, what was so disappointing reading all the reports is when Greater Manchester Police took control, as they obviously took control, they were absolutely stretched. And yet they had within Greater Manchester 52 fire stations with fully trained firemen there within five minutes response. And they never, as far as I can see, requested that assistance. And now you've got this broader firemen it, it's, it's still the word fire, they think it's fire, firemen. There's no fire at the arena, so we don't need firemen. But the, the skills they've got, just general skills, they're fit, they're intelligent, they're, they're a workforce. They can comfort people sat in the casualty recovery area. You know, I mean, they're a good, intelligent workforce. And I can't believe, and it's perhaps something that the Chief Officer and the Greater Manchester Police need to discuss, is to recognise what we could have contributed to, to that workforce there, not to deal with the fire, but just to be a, a, a trained workforce with skills that could have helped the ailing, the casualties, and what have you. And they were sat miles away, waiting in anticipation of wanting to get in there and do what they've been trained to do all their lives, and, and they missed that opportunity, or the Greater Manchester Police. And that would have released the police to do more skillful tasks in casualty recognition or whatever. It could have released the police to do their more skillful work by doing some of the fundamentals. That's just what I wanted to say, uh, Mr. Mayor. Would anyone like to pick up on that? I think what, what you're addressing there is the, uh, the criticism of the communications. Um, and I think from all parties, there's a desire to improve on those communications. And certainly, should ever one of these events happen again, um, that fire will be co-located with the police during that event. Because it's only when you're actually with somebody that you can actually learn um, what is going on, have the same situational awareness, and, and that's certainly something that we have learned from this, this event. Just to add, um, Chair, if I may, I mean, you're right, uh, Peter, there was a, um, the, the report highlighted a lack of communication between the two, and it's, it's important to say, you know, I, I, as, as I said at the beginning, there's no perfect response, and in those moments, you know, everyone's supreme, you know, kind of tested to the to the nth degree, aren't they? And, you, you know, you, you can't, it's not about necessarily blaming uh, people. The, the, the only thing in this instance was the rendezvous point was nominated as a cathedral and the fire service, I think, kind of took a, I would say, a bit too much of a rules-based view that, no, the rule book says we go further away and we go to Phillips Park. And I, that, it seems to be kind of the judgment that they made as, as Dawn said you know if they'd gone to the rendezvous point they would have gained the situational awareness of what was going on inside that have that have found out within an hour an hour and a half that it wasn't a, a hot incident you know it was it wasn't a marauding attack or it was a or it was a you know a safe-ish place to be and then it you know things would have the response would have been uh, would have been different so I think that that's the learn. The, there is a big learning point there, both for the fire service individually, but for the emergency services collectively, in terms of how they respond. Yvonne, on your point, I, I would want to facilitate that for the committee as much as you you, you would 
you would want to hear the voice of rank and file firefighters. I think it is very important. You know, I, 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 the way I put it to them when, when the deputy mayor and I went to, to meet everybody was like, this is the moment to put it on the table. You know, we can't keep doing this every you know, few years. You know, this is a moment really for, to, let, to let everybody have their say without, as I say, without any fear that there's sort of going to be a kind of something done or, you know, that they, they'll be marked down for, for having their say. And I, you know, I'd be more than happy to work with the committee to find ways in which you might see access to any written, maybe they might, you know, anonymized or something, but, you know, what, what we're receiving from a written point of view, but also if you wanted yourselves to, uh, to, um, uh, have access. I'm sure that can be that can be facilitated. Um, you know, the 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 one thing that's that's um, essential here is that we don't have a review that people feel repeats what they're complaining about. <laughs> you know, that it's too stifling, it's too top down. You know, because then we really will compound the problem if if we're not careful. So it really is essential, actually, that that we uh, allow people the space to speak freely. Uh, I've got David and Debbie. Paul's, is your comment relevant to this? So I'm going to take Paul first. Yeah, it was only a brief comment. As um, the Chief Fire Officer said, obviously, this report is about the fire service. I just want to reassure, assure members that there is multi-agency learning. So all of the individual agencies will be doing their own learning. But across Greater Manchester, we have a resilience forum, which the Deputy Mayor sits on, Beverly Hughes, so the other points about other agencies and multi-agency communication will be picked up, but obviously we're going to concentrate on the fire service today. David. Uh, yeah, I'm similar really. Uh, reading the first part of the report, it obviously contained a, a very detailed timeline of exactly what happened. And it seemed to me, having seen plans before in the past in various guises, that there was a plan in place, everybody did what they were supposed to do, everything operated according to what you would expect. But then the question is the, the, um, the flexibility of that, and for example, uh, engines being deployed further away to fill its part because they were within 500 meters. I, I don't know the rationale for that and, and whether that needs to be more flexible. But to me, the most important section, I think, was the one in 3.165 and onwards about the command support room. Because although uh, the, the fire service, they were, they, they deployed, you know, their most senior officers, their entire senior um, uh, management, as it were, they were operating out of Pendlebury and only one liaison officer was down at the multi-agency force command module. But I believe that the ambulance service were there. So there was much more integration and immediate decision making. And there was a, a slowdown in communication, it seems, because the fire service was operating at a senior level out of Pendlebury. So I presume that in future plans, in future integrated plans, that's going to be a key question that has to be addressed so that there's a, a proper integrated plan there in, in, instead of what happened, which may have been in accordance with existing plans, but probably not, not flexible enough. So I'll take one more. I'll take them in batches of two, and then if, okay, if yeah. you feel it, Deb, Debbie. Thank you, Chair. Um, as I previously member, uh, mentioned, I'm a, an ex-member of the fire service. I used to work in the control room. And I know there's an awful lot of emotion attached to this whole issue. I'm sure, Mr. Mayor, um, when you visited the troops the day after, the main emotions that have been felt by fire service members still serving and retired um, was anger and, and shame. Shame that they really felt that they'd let the people of Manchester down by what happened that night. Um, this isn't a time to carp or criticise, and I certainly wouldn't want to do that of the fire service. And I think this is a watershed moment for the fire service. The thing that strikes me more than anything in this, and this is where I, I as an ex-service member, I don't understand, and I admit it's a long, long time since I was a service member, is the isolation. You've got the control room, which used to be an integral part of any major incident the control room was the heart of it it was what it says it was where the incident was driven from senior officers got involved with senior officers in the control room and the 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 incident was managed on a dual uh, parallel lines between control staff and operational staff 
It seems to me the control room now, and I know it's not fire service members now, it's just Northwest Fire Control, it was just um, out there in Warrington having no input into what was happening. And then we had a plethora of officers in another location and then a command point somewhere else. So this is what I don't understand. It seems that on the night, nothing was joined up and that decisions were being made about fire service policy and strategy by non-fire service members. So going forward from this, what I would like to see is more joined up thinking for future planning. God forbid we have an incident like this again. I hope we don't. But that our response will be a joined up response from all parts of the fire service. And I think it'd be a wonderful idea to have some input at a committee like this from somebody from the FBU. Um, you would get a totally different viewpoint from what actually happens at um, you know, incidents of this type. Um, but like I say, I don't want to carp, I don't want to criticise, but I think that fire service policy, strategy and operational procedure should be a matter for fire service personnel. Thank you. We'd like to come back on it, any, any of those. I'm then going to take Stella, John Bell and Tim Pixton. In order. Well, just to agree very strongly with what you've both said, um, you, you mentioned the protocol. I think that is, you know, I think the deputy um, uh, the interim uh, chief said this a moment ago. Um, the, the, the national protocols didn't help us, I don't think, in this, in this instance. And I think it's, to be fair to the fire service, it's really important to say that. I, I think it's the nature of terrorist incidents. People remember that the, the vivid, you know, the last incident is very vivid in our minds, isn't it? So I think Paris was very vivid in everybody's mind. I, I'll be honest with you, on the night um, when I first got, you know, I got the news about quarter to 11, 10 to 11 from the chief constable, that's where my brain went straight away, marauding attack. That's why I was, you know, I was sitting there at home thinking, is this a marauding attack? Is this going to get worse than what, what we already know? So I think you know, we've all got to, rather than sitting you know, here, luxury of hindsight, everybody was in that, probably in that space. And if you remember, there were rumours floating around the news that there was a, something happening in, uh, there was something at the cathedral and there was possibly something at Old, Royal Oldham. And so it, it is difficult, but I think there is something different about the fire service culture to the other two services, which is a, a little more the rule book says this, therefore we do that, you know, and a bit less, well, hang on a minute, you know, we hear there's loads of ambulances at the scene and there's you know, a more pragmatic response. And, and I kind of feel partly that's for us at our level. You know, what, what do our three services do and again? And you know, God forbid if they're there again, but we do have to obviously think about that. And, and a more pragmatic, quick arrangement between the three of them that kind of, you know, enables that early assessment to be done of the incident so that they can kind of but there is a national dimension here and plans written on paper i think everyone's going to remember the limitations of a plan because every terrorist incident will present different a different scenario and you can't just kind of take the last one as the way we're going to respond to the next one you can't do that you have to have good judgment as you say from those joined up services in the moment uh, david and I think sometimes, you know, the, perhaps the way national guidance is written uh, possibly doesn't help that, and particularly doesn't help it if, you, if your culture within your service is a little bit rules-based and a, a little bit follow the, the book, the, the, you know, the book by the letter. So Lord Kersley did make recommendations of the government. You know, so there are things for us to do in terms of, you know, a joint command approach going forward. But he did make uh, recommendations of the government, and... I want just to say this. I thought, it, I, I, and I'm not make, making a party political point when I say this. I want, you know, do want to stress that. But I thought the government's lack of response on the day, and then only to an urgent question to the Kerslake report, didn't didn't feel appropriate to me. I, I'd have felt there should have been a, a, a stronger response. And um, it's also the case that, though we've asked, the government has refused to fund any part of the Kerslake report. Which again, I don't think you know. There's national learning here. This was a national event. Some of it should be borne by us because we're going to take the local learning and do something with it. But I also think there's 
there's learning nationally, and we've heard already today that, that, that the um, fire chiefs are looking at the Nilo issue. So I, I, I think I feel I need to say that just because, you know, th this is a shared responsibility that we've got with central government, and it's it, it's it's the Kerslake report. I don't think was was received in that spirit, and it should have it should have been. Uh, Debbie, on, on your point around um, the Warrington Northwest Fire Control. Um, I think it's true that the, the report did highlight weaknesses there in terms of the um, uh, potential disconnect between staff at Warrington and then tasking our, um, our own fire service. Um, and I think we should look at that arrangement, not necessarily making any kind of judgments in advance about what we actually do, but is it still the right arrangement for, for Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service? Um, and be, just go into that with an open, you know, I'm, I'm, there are financial commitments there and we have obligations to other, the other services that are also part of, part of that. And, but I, I do think we need to con consider that and see whether or not that arrangement might be strengthened to make it more GM specific, perhaps, so that if calls are coming in from Greater Manchester, they're handled by people with, with a knowledge of Greater Manchester. Um, so I think that, that is also you know, it's a legitimate question and I think we do need to, to look at look at those arrangements uh, as part of the work, uh, the work that we're doing. Stella. Thanks, Chair. Yes, actually, Andy, you almost answered one of the things I was going to say, that we, I'm, you know, this review, I'm sure, will make us a lot more prepared for a similar attack in the future, and hopefully there would be a much better outcome. But there won't necessarily be a similar attack. It's going to be different, isn't it? And we, all, we always make that mistake of being perfectly prepared for the last war or the last incident or the previous uh, crisis and not prepared for the next one. So I'm just hoping that this review will build in some kind of more flexibility to give people, because we want to try and imagine what the next attack will be, if there's going to be one, and I suppose the probability is high, even if not in Manchester. We have to try and think our way into the minds of the people who are doing this and think, what will they think of next? And that requires, as you say, a slightly more flexible approach for the planning stage than we've had before. I hope it'll be, I hope it'll, I'd like to see that built into the new plan when it's produced, thanks. John Bell. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to speak on a, a personal level in this debate, um, because as many of you know, I've been associated with Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue as a member for some 20 years over. And uh, when the Kerslake report came out on the 27th, I saw the lurid headlines about the fire service, which really, because I've been so tightly and so proud to serve as a member of it, these headlines really upset me. About a week later, I kept looking at, I kept reading about it and, and looking at, you know, what went wrong and what we could have done and what have you. But about a week later, Andy sent out an open letter. And that open letter lifted, well, certainly lifted a cloud off my head because having served on Greater Manchester for such a long time, I just felt that, you know, have, have we got, and, and I've worked cross-party on fire in Greater Manchester. And, you know, party politics have never, ever entered into the blue light services as far as I'm concerned in Greater Manchester. And whilst I'm still a council, I hope it, I never, ever see that day. But the open letter, because I felt for the lads and lasses on the ground, the officers, I've served under four um, chief officers in Greater Manchester, and I know the hard work, both at officer level and through the lads and lasses on the fire ground, how much effort and dedication that they put in every day in their working lives. I've also, I also currently uh, serve on the local government association, fire services management committee, 
where I still represent Greater Manchester. And I know how much Greater Manchester Fire Service is looked upon throughout the nation. We are the leaders. I still believe we are the leaders. And what is refreshing for me tonight here is to hear Handy say, you know, and I'm not blaming, the blame game should not enter into this because it's obviously a communication problem. There are lessons to be learned. But nevertheless, I, I, I find it absolutely refreshing to sit here tonight and be part of this debate to know that Greater Manchester is going to go forward. Yes, you know, I've served on collaboration at the Home Office collaborating to get the ambulance, the police, and the fire service working together. That is the way forward. And it is disappointing when I read the Kerslake report that some of the fundamental things didn't happen on that night. And it will haunt me personally because, you know, conscientiously, everyone within the service want to see more collaboration and better collaboration amongst the blue light services. So, we've started off here having a task and finish group. And uh, I, along with Yvonne, uh, we had a great meeting with Leon uh, last week to look at some of the things that, that we, we feel that the task and finish group here should be looking at, and I've, I really, to be honest, I cheated by look at, remembering my knowledge of the things that we used to deal with at uh, fire authority level to try and bring them, but not everything, but the, the more important points, to bring them into this forum uh, when uh, fire has the opportunity to, um, to have a say of what is going on. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been very upsetting uh, for me personally, and I think anybody to do with the fire service, but thank you, Andy, for being honest with us and, and taking this forward because lessons are to be learned and, and everyone is, is, it's an open book that, that there's no blame. That report from Kerslake is balanced, as you said earlier on, and everyone, the police, the ambulance, communications, they've all, they all can learn from it. And I'm sure, I'm sure they will. And we'll go forward in Greater Manchester to have an even better reputation than we have now nationally. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. And Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I guess what we're talking about is is the fire service response in a very major incident, is it not? And, um, and I think I'm, I'm actually quite assured that the fire service has developed really robust rules and procedures for doing things. And I think we can all sleep more easily at night knowing that the fire service has got some very well established rules in place that look after us every night, I think, to be honest. But um, the thing I, I just like to think about is, is the rule book talking about the fire service rule book essentially saying that the fire service needs to be half a kilometre away thinking about a, is it a marauding shooter say for example because um, obviously you know we live in a world city in a really dangerous world and something horrible is quite possibly going to happen in the future isn't it and it could be marauding shooter it could be a marauding lorry it could be a series of bombs it could be you know it could be something we can't imagine um, and it's just thinking about how we get the balance right between um, our public protection responsibility because I think the public would expect that our emergency services are looking after us is what we'd expect, isn't it? Um, and then also we have a responsibility about the people who who work for us, you know, in the public service, I guess, you know, be, be they firefighters or police officers or, or paramedics or whatever, about, about their safety as well. But it's just about getting the balance right, isn't it? About how we, how we, how we keep our staff safe, but also how we protect members of the public in a, in a really horrific situation that we can't think about really. And I just wondered if, if we're thinking about those sort of difficult things when we're thinking about reviewing the procedures and i don't know whether or not there are ways there are things we can do to make it safer for firefighters thinking about the types of terrorism that now happen i don't know i'm not i'm not an expert you, you are i'm not pretending to be but i'm just i just wondering if those are the sort of things we're thinking about and then just finally just on the communications 
is, is I guess at the moment the fire service is run from somewhere, Greater Manchester Police is run from somewhere, and the ambulance service is run from somewhere, and I guess they're probably all in different places. I just wondered, given that ultimately they're all, I suppose, in the combined authority coming through, you know, either to you, Andy, or other bits of the combined authority, if there is scope actually over, over time bringing command together, I guess, on a, rec on a permanent basis, so that there's a sort of a permanent communication between in, in, between our emergency services. I appreciate there's a lot of things, hurdles to jump over to do that, but I'm just wondering if that's something, given that we are a combined authority and we're bringing things together, that's something we could think about in the in the long term. Thank you, Chair. Would you like to respond to those three? I'm happy to. Do you want to pick up anything? Um, when we're discussing about the, the new fire plan and what will the services that Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service provide in the future and how will they, f um, they look and what will the shape of them be, I think it's really important that we build in a look at future risk. So we're not just designing a fire service based on past demand, but we're looking at those risks going forward and making sure that the, we are resourced properly so that we can uh, ensure that, that, that people's safety. Um, the other point I wanted to pick up was around the, the, the health and safety culture. And I think actually in the world of fire, things have come a long way from the time when um, a number of years ago, it felt like the health and safety executive was out to get us. And there was very much uh, an air of um, over um, compensating and, uh, for firefighter safety. And I think we've got a much more balanced relationship uh, with the HSE and that we recognize that actually there will time be times where there has to be an element of risk for public good. Um, but I think that needs to be built into guidance nationally. I think trying to do that out of step with what uh, goes on in the, the, the national resilience community will bring us into to distribute. So I think the pressure's got to be on further up the, the chain that there needs to be uh, that guidance that, that puts the balance between uh, public and firefighter risk right. And then uh, lastly, I think um, you, you're asking about um, uh, combined command. Um, certainly, I think if we weren't starting from where we are now, then that would be the option that we would look to pursue. I think the complications are that we're not starting with a blank sheet of paper when it comes to that. And certainly in the past, the, um, the pressure was on a fire and fire control uh, rather than a fire health and, uh, and police control. Right, thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you Mayor. Um, on, on a couple of those points, um, for example, that Stella made, uh, quite right, um, you, you shouldn't make too many specific plans to deal with specific issues, and, and what we try to do is have, um, this is in Greater Manchester, on the broader sense, a generic response plan that where all the agencies all the 999s and all the different agencies, including local authorities, highways, utilities, etc., are all aware of that plan and their role. So they operate within it uh, routinely. And then there are specific plans that you pull out for a bespoke incident. So I'd like to assure you that that, that is, is the concept that we try to operate. Um, I think on the collaboration, as, as the Chief Fire Officer has already said, there is, on, I'd like to assure you, on a daily basis, there is collaboration between all those agencies as well. And although, as, as uh, the Chief Fire Officer said, <coughs> of course, different organisations have their headquarters in different buildings, uh, usually and in different parts of, of the uh, city region, we do have co-located command facilities, and we're all very familiar with using those. Uh, and, and we can't go into fully explaining today why actually on what was the most critical incident some of that fell down it does happen and does work effectively routinely so th it was a very unusual incident for that reason and obviously we need to understand that and i think that point about rules and health and safety um yes as the chief fire officer said 
there has been challenges in the past where health and safety would seek to pursue an organisation, but the public expectation is, particularly for the 999 services, that they're there to take calculated risks. And there is always that challenge there, but that, that opportunity to take a dynamic risk assessment to say, we know what the guidance is, but the guidance isn't black and white you must do. This is guidance to say how to deal with an incident and then you apply dynamic risk assessment and you take some risk. Uh, and it is it's making sure that everyone is comfortable to take that appropriate risk and to communicate. So I'd like to assure you that is you know, the way we want to work going forward and have done in the past. Make one point in response to the point at which you made and it reflects the Mayor's earlier comments. Um, you, you mentioned that the um, the rationale for the withdrawal beyond 500 metres was part of the fire rule, but let me assure you it's not. That's part of the national guidance in respect of marauding terrorist incidents. So that I think that the Mayor's allusion earlier on to, to, uh, to the fact that there are issues that government needs to respond to arising out of the Kerslake report is really, really pertinent here. Because while we can look back and say, yes, the decision was wrong for all sorts of reasons, actually it was made in good faith based on an interpretation of national guidance, which we have to challenge now. And just to, sorry, Chair, to pick up a few things, once I, just, I did want to come back to John's excellent uh, contribution just to end with, but to pick up very quickly, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really difficult one, Tim, isn't it? It's a, it's a really difficult balance, because if anyone goes to ground zero uh, in the US, what you will see there is the names of hundreds of firefighters who perhaps were sent into harm's way without adequate regard for their safety and I think you know that should play on the minds of all of us really you know it's quite quite a uh, quite quite a haunting thing to, to, to see actually so you're right you know there is a there is a, a balance here isn't there you know people who are fire and you know, we hear it from our own fight they want to do it they want to be there I think Peter said that before they, they you know but the organization has to have a regard for their safety so hence the hence the um, the guidelines it's a case of getting the the balance the balance right you know the joint commander we're touching this with with debbie you know it, it, we'll, we'll open up the question how far we can go we don't we don't know what i will what we will do and we will come back to the committee on a regular basis up with this is our we'll formally respond to each of the Kerslake recommendations as they fall to greater manchester I, I will be, and we will share with you the thinking that is emerging on the, in those, because they're quite complex questions, and I think as the interim chief was saying, we can't answer them sort of straight away. They are, will all need to be unraveled, but we will come back to you with, you know, where our thinking is on, on, on these things. Some of them do fall, as Eamon was just saying, for the Prime Minister and, um, uh, and the government and the Home Secretary. And so I'll be writing shortly to the government to, to say, well, here are the recommendations that, that fall to government. And we would like a formal response from the government because this is a, a, joint, uh, a joint exercise. Stella, very quickly, I think it's important for me to point out that s flexibility was shown on the night because bear in mind the police were in initial control of the scene. But it's, it's, it's very important for me to say that, the, um, you know, the, that those in command did allow people into the city room. Um, and that allowed treatment to be given, even though that was a very big, difficult judgment at the, mo at the moment that that was done, but a small number of paramedics were allowed in. And let's, you know, we're praising the first responders tonight, but let's remember the zero responders, as they were called, staff from Northern Rail, staff from the arena, members of the public who were there and helping as well. So actually a, prag a flexible, pragmatic judgment was taken. And th the advanced paramedic at the scene, I think also took some very, you know, brave decisions that, that actually ultimately paid paid many dividends. Um, John, I think, you know, you put what you, you say very well, and, it, you know, uh, the passion in what you said was, was, was evident. Nobody acted in bad faith, and I'm, no, no one's pointing the finger at anybody, actually. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Um, I think you know, what had happened was a kind of way of working had built up over the years, particularly internally and also perhaps not, not as joined up with the other services. And, and on the night, it, it kind of... Uh, it, it, it didn't work as, as well as any of us would have would have hoped. But I, I'm not doing this in a kind of spirit of recri recri recrimination. You just, we just have to be honest, don't we, with ourselves. M my job ultimately is to protect the public of Greater Manchester, and, and I've got to be able to, to look them in the eye and say, yeah, we, we, we were honest with ourselves, and we've learned something, and we're going to come back and you know have something that's, that's stronger. You know, it's, it's really important to say after the IRA bomb in '96. 
that didn't work so well on the day in terms of particularly the health service side of things. The Manchester Royal Infirmary was in and overwhelmed actually with, with people who arrived there. A lot of learning has taken place in those 20 years since. And the health service on the night, I think it's right to say, put in place a very sophisticated uh, plan from the casualty clearing station at Victoria Station, which meant that patients were sent to the right hospitals in terms of their injuries, but also advance notice was given to those hospitals, a bed was cleared for those patients. You know, it really was something that everybody should feel an immense degree of pride in. It was a very, very complex but high quality uh, operation borne out by the fact that only one patient was subsequently um, reallocated from one hospital to another. Uh, the rest stayed, received the treatment to the hosp in the hospitals to which they were originally uh, sent. So I sent the letter because, you know, it's not just about the front line. Everyone will praise the front line. There are outstanding public servants right the way through Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service who, who are completely motivated by that wish to serve the GM public. For whatever reason, somewhere along the road, things have, you know, the, I've got, you know, the, the organisation isn't as connected as it maybe, maybe would have been. And, and it's our job just to sort of, to hear that and put it, and put it right. And that's what we're, um, what, what we're trying uh, to do. Um, I, um, I think you're right. We do owe Lord Kerslake a debt of thanks. I think he did produce a, a report that, that was tough and didn't pull its punches, but actually did it in a way that was balanced and gives us something that, that, that we can respond to. He, he said, his words, that we were brutally tested on the night of Monday, the 22nd of May. But overall, we stood up well. And I think we've got to really remember that. You know, as, we, as we're prepared to look at the difficult bit, we, we, remember, we remember that. And actually, if you read it too, the praise that was given for all of our public services, for Manchester City Council particularly, in terms of the leadership of the civic response, but police, fire and ambulance, everybody, and the community afterwards was, you know, it was something that I don't think we've ever witnessed uh, before in this, in this country, uh, possibly around the world. And I've had so many people, other mayors from around the world, say that to me, that they, they saw something truly incredible in Manchester at that, at that difficult uh, moment. And I, I don't know if you all saw, but last week when the GCHQ uh, announced that they are now about to open a Manchester base, they, I thought it was very telling that they p paid particular tribute to the response of the people uh, and the public service of Greater Manchester in, in kind of persuading them that this was the right place uh, to come to. You know, that they, they were saying that the, that the degree of togetherness was by far, and in a way, the best response to terrorism that they've ever seen. And I just think that that, you know, that, that is one of the families who lost a loved one got in touch with me to say that they thought that was one of the best things that had happened since last year that actually the intelligence services recognise the strength of our communities and are coming here to improve the strength of their intelligence uh, going forward. So, you know, there are difficult things for us, and we've debated them this evening, but by God, there's some fantastic things for us to, um, uh, to, be, to be proud of as well. So, Luke's got some comments. I've got some comments. Did you have some comments? So, we'll start with Luke. Move to John. Um, thank you, and thank I'll you for your responses so far. Um, so really reflecting on the whole discussion, I think, um, as we all know, we need to take our GTC quite seriously. So I'd quite like some clarity about which issues do remain, if any, um, which have been resolved locally, which have been resolved nationally, um, and which issues, issues remain locally and which issues remain nationally so that we can see what progress is being made. And I also think that we need to think about how we, as a, as a committee, scrutinise the processes you've outlined going forward, how we do that most effectively, because obviously um, this is perhaps the most serious thing we will ever look at. So let's put a bit of thought into how we do that properly. John. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just to summarise, really, because I've listened to everybody here, and one of the main things that seems to come out of the report is communication. And we've, we've all mentioned communication. And But i go one further. It's communication and integration of the blue light services and if an incident happens again rather than three separate teams trying to communicate with each other we, what we really in my opinion need is we know who's going to be in charge and i would suggest that's somebody from gmp 
and then the word goes out to all the blue lights from from that source rather than waiting for information to filter down to each bit and we know and we know because I was talking earlier and uh, if if a resident picks up the phone and says fire then they'll just get put through to fire or police just through to police and there's no integration happening so maybe we need to look at that as the uh, for the future so I've got I've, I've got a couple of comments I, I wrote these down earlier and, and Luke saved it to the end to mention one of them but um you've alluded that you were conscious 18 months or so ago that morale was low we know we've had a recruitment issue and when we've suspended the review because of that um, I've been struggling with your new fire advisory board is made up of 11 out at the 11 of the 15 are effectively the old fire authority including the chair and the vice chair and there's four females on there I guess for gender balance otherwise potentially it might have been 15 out of 15 I, I just struggle with how you've ended up appointing the same fire advisory board or the same people when you've alluded to the fact that you had problems 18 months or so ago and it's a culture now okay i accept we didn't know it was a culture issue particularly until the Kerslake report comes out will you be addressing the fire advisory board or is that in itself fit for purpose in the light of the Kerslake report we've had so that's point one we've had uh, the first review just before christmas we was suspended which was we, we understand why now we've Kerslake has uh, recommended a second review. We're going to wrap them all into one. That's potentially going to take a little longer because there's more to consider. Do we know what the time scale is? We've, uh, so that's point number two. Point number three, we've had the transfer of the fire reserves. Obviously, there may well be a cost implication. We haven't got Richard Paver with us, but have we considered the cost implication of the subsequent review, the fact that we're under review and we need to recruit and all those things wrap into one? Because this is what I believe the nitty gritty, as Luke has alluded to, not what has happened, but how it's going to happen. And we're looking at, I think there's a massive opportunity and I think we're 100% right to write to the rank and file and say, you don't, it wasn't their fault and it clearly wasn't. But culture change, in any organization is harder than the most things I think but your opportunity is you and you and dawn is relatively new so I just I just need to get a grip on how you're gonna get there and um, and then finally um, the non fire service uh, res uh, points in the curves like how are they progressing it's not really our concern we are concerned with the fire service but they all need to go hand in hand and is there a point where we'll say you know what we've implemented them and do, will that run in tandem with whatever period of time it's going to take for the fire service so i know there's some quite crucial points there but i'd, I'd be interested to try and put if you could put some flesh on those bones so um luke in, in answer to your to your questions um I, I think we need to set out really clearly what we think are recommendations for us and the process by which we're going to come up with an answer to those recommendations. So some of them will probably be able to be answered by the, the fire. Well, one of the recommendations is a broad recommendation about leadership and culture of the fire service. And obviously the, the review we're doing will, will deal with that. But others linked to the issues that well, John's just raised, you know, communication between our blue light services. Um, so it is true that in this instance, um, you know, because like found that you know the, the, those on the scene that people couldn't get through to their phones and that that doesn't seem to be a, an acceptable arrangement going forward it needs to be an, an ability for people in that position to immediately contact each other um, by whatever whatever means that that is but you know we, we need to, to to think about that I, I think what, what what we need is a, a clarity about what is for us and what are we responsible for and what is for the government so I'm quite happy to share with the committee the letter that I intend to send to the Prime Minister, which will I, you know, which, which I will lay out the recommendations that I believe are are for, are, 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 are for her and the government. It's not just the issue about protocols that I mentioned a, a moment ago. It's the question of Vodafone and the national uh, emergency telephony system uh, that completely failed on the night. Um, that 
we, we have flushed out a failing in that system and I think it's you know reasonable that we are given a full response from the from the home office as to what what they will do not just if it happened here again but anywhere in the in the country so having a real I think you know an open approach to these recommendations and where we're up to with a response but also flat you know being clear whether it's it's for others to respond and, and then you know kind of updating as and when we've received their response um, that, that's what I um, I, I intend uh, to do. I, I mean, I, I say, please, no, I wish nobody to take this as a partisan point. I, I would like to see the government respond to this report as it would any national report of this significance. As you say, this is like this. This is the first major terrorist attack of this nature outside of London. So, therefore, it is a national event. When I was shadow Home Secretary, and the current Prime Minister was the Home Secretary. I responded to in the House of Commons in relation to the Bataclan incident in Paris. And I, and I explicitly asked her that day, while London may be you know, ready to, to deal with a, a complex terrorist attack, are other UK cities, you know, what is their state of readiness? And I pushed her quite a lot on it uh, in that period. Um, and that for me is a national question, the, the, the resilience of UK cities. It's not for, they can't say it's devolution, you know, really, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I, 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 you know, nobody should take that as it, it being a kind of cheap shot, it's not. This was, in my view, a national report that should be co-owned by the government where they agree with us, I would say, preference would be, we agree a day together when we'll both respond to our different recommendations and we'll jointly uh, respond to this report. Um, and, I, and I think that would be the way, you know, the, 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 the right way to, to, to um, um, respect the significance of what Lord Kerslake has said. John, on communication, I, I, um, I think that, you know, that we just need to come back with, you know, you're right in, in terms of what, what, what you say. Um, and that there is this question of Northwest fire control and, you know, that we, we have to, if, if we can't undo that arrangement anytime soon, not that we would want to, but if we, you know, we were looking at uh, how we might make it more responsive to the great needs of Greater Manchester, then I, th I think that that is, is something that we, sh we should we, we should um, uh, should explore. There is one thing I want to say to the committee, which is something I, I would maybe welcome the committee taking a look at uh, as well. It's been put to me um, that the Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service is better resourced than its neighbouring fire services still, and actually we are in many ways holding up the fire services around us in terms of our capability to respond of event incidents outside of greater manchester now I, i've not got the statistics and i'd be interested to see them but you know i do know for instance a large number of, well, a number of greater manchester pumps attended the, the car park fire in liverpool uh, I, I, it suggested that that's not a one-off event that we do attend fires outside of GM on a reasonably regular basis. Now, again, I'm stressing I don't have the figures. I, I think you know, we need to take a look at ourselves, but I think possibly we need a conversation with, with our neighbours as well to say, well, what is a, you know, what's, how is everybody funding their fire service? And do we have a situation that where we're all being fair to each other in terms of the, the, you know, the, the way in which we're um, communicating with each other, the way in which we're resourcing? Uh, our ability to respond and I, I, I do think that that is an issue that, that we need to um, uh, a difficult issue yes but one we need to have a conversation about uh, Nathan in terms of chair in terms of your questions um, th th there is a, uh, a review underway internally uh, about governance and, I, I, and I, I want to stress that this is in particular to the fire service you know this is not the fire service on its on its own actually there's been a broader um, review going on the way I feel in terms of almost one year into my role is we kind of been in transition from an old world to a new world, if I can put it that way. The reality of a mayor, it would be true, whoever it was, if it was not me, is that obviously when the public have got one person to, to kind of approach and, and um, direct their um, concerns to, it, it kind of becomes confusing if there's still a committee there and, and a mayor here, you know, who's, who, you know, who's in charge? You know, that's, that's the kind of, kind of feeling it might give. So it's not just true of, um, uh, true of fire. Transport would be another good example. You know, where do the committee go if they've got a concern? Is it to TF, uh, TFGM's committee? Is it here? You know, and, I, and I think 
there's been a bit of double running in some ways in terms of, you know, we've not quite got our new arrangements um, uh, streamlined, I would say. There is a, another issue of cost as well, of course, isn't there? How much does it cost to run all of these committees? Are they the right size? So that review has been ongoing. And, you know, I, I don't want to, to preempt it because it's likely to come to the next um, combined authority meeting. Um, but it actually goes back to, to, to John's question. The issue is, could we maybe better bring together police and fire at the GM level through a governance arrangement that might begin to look more, less in the silos, more in, uh, more in conjunction. And that's, that's something that you know, is certainly has been suggested that we, sh we should think about. And actually there is some thinking going on in this building up about that. So you know, that, that's my response on, on the fire board question. How to get there, re, um, you know, turning around maybe some, some of where we are in terms of the culture within the fire service. I think it's, it's, it would be hard to say that one thing will do it or, you know, one intervention, you know, it's not going to be like that. I, I think, you know, I want to pay uh, tribute to Dawn tonight. I thought she handled um, uh, a difficult day with great dignity on behalf of Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. And actually, it's not just me saying that. I heard um, many people say that from within the fire service um, uh, in, the, in the days afterwards. Um, and I think... We are new players, if you like, on on, on the block, as as you say. And I, I say I'm not I'm not pointing the fingers at individuals. I didn't do it on the day, and I'm not doing it tonight. I, I think, though, we do have a chance to say, well, that was then. This is now. How do we, you know, kind of build a sort of different dialogue with people internally, listen to what they're saying, um, and and then start to move this culture forward. I, I've, I've pointed to one issue tonight: annual leave. But I think it's, it's an important one because I think it, it's not necessarily about the kind of the job of being at the fire and how we respond there. But it's just day to day, how do they feel? You know, just, I was a bit, I'll be honest with you, I was very surprised to hear that in 2018, frontline public uh, servants were basically being told randomly when they could take their leave. I mean, I, I found that a surprise, I'll be absolutely honest with you. And... Um, and I think that's a product of a, a culture, perhaps, that isn't enough about empowering them, listening to them, that, but is almost just telling them how it's going to be. And I just kind of think there, there are probably some quite simple things that can be done to start to bring people, uh, people back, uh, back together. Um, I, I, mentions been made this evening of the emergency medical response. I think that was a brilliant innovation of Great Manchester Fire and Rescue uh, Service. Um, and, you know, I... I would like to talk, to, I think it was mentioned by uh, Peter. I, I think we, my question would be, you know, for the money the council taxpayers give to GMFRS every year, they've got to get the best possible safety for their family, haven't they, in re return for that money. That's the job, isn't it? It's, it's not about just sort of kind of thinking about, well, can the fire service do a bit of this, a bit of that? And a bit? How do we save as many lives as possible every year through the work of Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service? And yes responding to fires, but all, I believe we shouldn't let go of this issue about emergency medical response, because ambulances increasingly are trapped on the roads, they're, they're held up outside A&E. Our fire service is embedded in our communities, and if you're going to save somebody from a heart attack, it needs to be within those first three or four minutes. And I, I, I've heard from the front line saying to me, well, we can't be paramedics on the cheap. It's a tough thing to try and save somebody who's having a heart attack. You know, if we're going to do it, we need to be rewarded for doing it, and we need to be properly supported and trained. And I think all of those are valid points. But I, I kind of feel we need to build some of that into, um, uh, into, our, you know, into our thinking as well. Um, and, you know, yes, listen to the front line, but also challenge as well. Say, well, you know what, on behalf of the council taxpayers, I think we need to, to, you know, to ask you to do more in this area. Now, I think the whole issue of that pilot got trapped a bit in the national dispute around pay. And I think you know, that would have to be unlocked if we were to, you know, we'd have to work with the FPU at national level. But I, I want all of these things in the mix. But I think what I, what I want to come through this is an empowered, reinvigorated, um, you know, kind of more, more open, transparent fire and rescue service. Um, and, I, and I think that is perfectly, you know, I'm glad you, you said the same, Chair. I think it's perfectly achievable if we all go into it with open minds, with the right spirit. And I'm going to um, Manchester Central tomorrow to, to talk to, to 
to staff. And actually not just say that frontline firefighters are the only voices we hear, speak to staff in uh, prevention, speak to staff in, in human resources, in every bit of the organization. Let's hear everybody's voice in a fair way. And let's see if we can bring them all back together and uh, get this great organization you know, back where we would all want it to be. Right, <clears throat> thank you for that. I have, I've got one more note, which I don't really uh, want to respond to, but have we thought about, and, and perhaps we could, getting the equivalent of the Kerslake report for the Bataclan 9-11 the Mumbai attacks and actually seeing if there's anything in there that we may have missed? There was, why reinvent the wheel? I think that there might be some, and other attacks for that matter, and just try and cross-reference. And that was just, it's just a suggestion for me that crossed my mind when you mentioned Bataclan. Yes, um, I, think, I, think, I think we have, I don't know whether the committee is, is aware of um, the work of Cathy uh, uh, Oldham, Dr. Cathy Oldham. Um, she's um, lead uh, resilience, chief, chief resilience officer for Greater Manchester. You know, we are one of the, um, the Rockefeller 100 resilient cities. So we, we are renowned actually for the work we've been doing in this, in this space. And I think you know the committee should um, invite Cathy, um, uh, supported by Paul, perhaps to come and come and talk to you about the the thinking that has been done, learning from a whole range of threats actually to to GM, not just um, not just a terrorist attack. Another thing, if I may, just say very quickly, uh, Chair, which is important too. There was this there was this whole question in the Anderson report about the intelligence. So. The, the truth is that MI5 did receive um, information uh, at the early part of 2017 related to the individual who um, committed this atrocity that in the end was actually you know, very accurate. Um, and while he was flickering on their radar, not enough was um, known or he, he wasn't doing enough to make them sort of really put that to the top of their top of their list what that said to me was um, in conversation with with them and with the home secretary was that hang on a minute you know, intelligence in our country seems to have been forged in my view in, in the you know the cold war period northern ireland al qaeda you know where you're dealing with highly organized but also kind of very um, capable and, you know, where you need a high degree of secrecy in terms of what you are doing so that you don't, you know, you don't share, share with, with them. The truth of the matter is the threat now, if we're thinking about the Bataclan and all those other incidents that you mentioned, it's more homegrown, you know, it's more lone wolf. It's people who are kind of probably reading stuff on the internet and then acting in a, in a kind of looser, looser way. So I think the old model of intelligence where it goes into London and someone in a room in London says yay or nay, we'll do, you know, it's asking too much of people at that level, to be honest with you. And what we have suggested is that we might be a pilot for a new way of handling intelligence. So if a decision was taken by the national security agencies not to uh, act on a piece of tele intelligence received, it, it, that it would be passed back to the local level and said, well, we haven't decided to act, but we want, you need to know that we had information on this individual and you may need to think of a local arrangement whereby, you know, there's a, there's a, a kind of a watching brief, if you like, or a kind of monitoring process. Uh, so I've put us, uh, and we've been accepted, there, there will be a, I think I'm right in saying there will be a, um, a pilot that, right. that has agreed with us. And I think that is a, a you know, a piece of learning that, it's outside of the Kurzlake report, but it's also, you know, the Anderson report did touch on our, the attack at our arena. And I think that that's somewhere too, where I don't have all the answers, but I, st I feel that it's the right thing to try and do. Because it's like many things, isn't it, we're, we're talking about with devolution. Decisions taken in London, as we've done in this country for many years, aren't necessarily in the future always going to be the right decisions. They're, they're, they're far away from our communities. And I think you could apply that same principle to intelligence as, as well. And um, we have the commission that Rishi Shori is leading that, that is going to make recommendations uh, later, June, we think. And that's more about tackling violent extremism within our communities. I think we've got to work with um, faith groups, community groups, to kind of build that resilience. You know, if people see people acting in an extreme or, a, uh, you know, a violent way, peddling hateful material, of whatever kind, 
We should be clear about how we report that in Greater Manchester. What's the responsibilities of families, of communities to report that kind of information? And is there a mechanism at the GM level that can kind of link with the security agencies to better manage you know, individuals who, who may be the ones who could potentially pose a threat to our, to our community? So, sorry, I know that's a kind of big thing to open up, but you were asking about you know, the best possible response to what happened. And I want you to know that our thinking is you know, pretty broad and pretty deep in terms of um, uh, you know, fully responding to this, as Luke said, you know, something that will, you know, will be the most serious thing that probably any of us ever have to deal with. You know, how, how do we get a response that is both you know, it's on, on our public services and how they work together and how they communicate, on our communities in terms of their cohesion, on the way we manage intelligence about, about people uh, living here? Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Paul. Eamon, in his absence, thank you. So much information. So much appreciated for your time. Um, and at that, we shall move on to the next agenda item. Feel free to stay for it. Feel free to leave if you want. <laughs> um, so, a little bit of light relief. Greater Manchester Strategic Implement Implementation Plan Performance Dashboard. Simon Noakes, I am so sorry. Thank you very much. Um, so we've brought this report to you. You'll remember um, last year that we uh, produced the updated Greater Manchester strategy. Um, and at that point, we said it was highly important that we thought about how that strategy was going to be implemented across all uh, agencies, public and private, in Greater Manchester. And we produced an interim implementation plan uh, for the first six months of, that, uh, of the strategy, which took us from October last year to, to March this year. Uh, we'll be going through the process um, of thinking about two things. For, firstly, about how we produce an implementation plan uh, which uh, implements that Greater Manchester strategy over the next two years, um, but also how we monitor uh, progress towards the Greater Manchester strategy over, over the next two years as well. Um, and what you've got in front of you uh, tonight, and obviously you had a previous report on a, a draft of what the uh, policy dashboard would look like for the, uh, for the Greater Manchester Strategy, but what you've got uh, in front of you tonight um, is a report that sets out the draft implementation plan for the next two years, uh, which is going to the combined authority at the end of the month for approval, and obviously subject to, uh, to your comments and input, um, but also sets out the dashboard of uh, performance data uh, against which we are going to be uh, measuring progress uh, over that next two years. Um, a number of points to make, I guess. Firstly, um, in the uh, initial interim uh, uh, implementation plan, we set out or tried to set out almost everything that was going on in Greater Manchester uh, over the next six months that we needed to achieve. Um, in this plan, uh, we've taken a slightly different approach, which is to say there's a vast amount of stuff going on across Greater Manchester um, that is essential to the Greater Manchester strategy being delivered. That is captured within all of the different strategies that we have, be that cultural strategies or transport strategies or, or other, other documents. Um, and we've just kind of noted that and uh, um, kind of said that that's important that all of that happens. But in the implementation plan, we're trying to capture those things that we believe are truly transformational, that are required a, a kind of cross-agency effort um, and a real focus on those things. Um, and there are only a small number under each of the 10 GMS priorities. Um, so under each of those priorities, we've captured a small number of things we think are genuinely transformational, uh, or we should, sorry, we genuinely need to focus on if we're going to achieve the transformation we need in order to achieve the Greater Manchester strategy targets. Um, and that's the left-hand column, effectively, of, of, of each of the uh, priority ta or the tables under each priority. The right-hand column under each priority then describes uh, what we need to do in the next six months towards those transformational actions. Um, so as I say, you won't see absolutely everything captured in there, but we, these are the things that we believe, looking at the targets we've set in the strategy and looking at the progress towards those targets through the dashboard data, which I'll come on to in a second, uh, we believe those are the things that we need to, to focus on and what we need to do in the next six months in order to, to, to have achieved those by 2020. 
Um, we've tried to uh, have extensive uh, engagement to date uh, in the development of the, of the implementation plan uh, to work with all of the different portfolios to say what are the things that uh, you believe are important, to work with um, the uh, voluntary sector organisation, uh, GMCVO, uh, uh, for their input into that strategy, uh, to work with the local enterprise partnership again to get their input and now taking it through the, uh, all of the um, scrutiny committees uh, of the CA uh, before going to the CA uh, as a whole. Um, so what, what we want uh, from you tonight is obviously your comments and, and, and input into that strategy, uh, sorry, into that implementation plan. Uh, do you think we've focused on the right things? Are there things you think we, have, we are missing? Um, and then also to move on to the, uh, to the dashboard, I won't go through it uh, in great detail, but you'll remember from the, from the last version that you saw, what we've tried to say is for each in the GMS, we have set headline targets uh, of where we want to be by 2020. We're really conscious that if you just look at those headline targets, uh, you will get a skewed picture of what's being achieved and, and where each individual priority is going. So what we've tried to do is, is set out in this dashboard a wider range of, of indicators which might demonstrate progress uh, towards those targets. And it's from looking at those overall headline targets and the range of indicators that we're then saying, well, actually, what do we need to do to make the transformation uh, that we, we need to achieve uh, the, the overall greater management strategy? So for each priority, you've got a sheet, uh, a single sheet, which sets out the, the overall targets and the performance against those targets. Each of those is rated about whether they're red, amber, and green uh, in terms of whether we think they're on, t on track for achieving uh, GMS uh, and also the direction of travel. So it might be green and improving or, or amber and improving or red and declining. And then a, a couple of supporting indicators um, and then we've got a, a kind of three or four bullet points about the kind of context and the challenge we face. Uh, so that gives you a, bit, a little bit of context uh, in, in that overall uh, uh, performance assessment. We, the plan is that we will update the uh, implementation plan on a six-monthly basis. So in October and in April every year, we'll update the implementation plan. Effectively, the uh, Left-hand column, as I describe it, in, under each priority is fixed. Those are the transformational things we need to focus on over the next two years. The right-hand column, i.e. what we're going to do in the next six months towards those transformational actions, will be updated six-monthly, as will the performance data. And that should give us a pretty good view, view about whether or not uh, we are on track uh, for delivering of the targets and where we need to uh, re um, focus resources and effort uh, if, indeed, we're not on target. The other thing that we're going to do is in October of each year, we're going to produce a kind of state of Greater Manchester report, which will go into a little bit more detail than this performance dashboard goes into about the kind of key economic, social and environmental uh, issues that Greater Manchester faces uh, and provide that, as I say, that state of Greater Manchester report. So I think at that point, I'll uh, close my, my comments and I'll obviously uh, invite comments and questions. So I'll open that. I've, just, okay, I've got one comment to open with. Um, Considering working on red, amber, green, we've got black and grey, and we've got to mentally translate it. So when you look at this report, it doesn't look... I, so next time, could we have it in colour, or at least spot colour, at least? Uh, I'll open it to the floor. Anybody got any questions? If you look on your screen, it's a beautiful colour. And it's cheaper than printing. Anyway, I, I just wondered about the... So I understand why we're looking at the six months ahead, as a, this is what we're going to achieve in six months. But I guess that, for me, that makes it... Well, A, it's quite easy to understand, so that's great. Isn't it? But it's also quite um, sim simple or simplistic, for want of a better word, because most things take longer than six months to, to achieve, I guess. So I guess that somewhere that you have, for example, a much longer-term view about what's happening in the following six months or in four six months' time, because that's the lead-in time to achieve that. And this is the simple version i guess to make it manageable for us to assess is that is that is that the correct answer i just i, I would worry that we're just thinking in six months chunk, chunks is my only thought i suppose no no broad sorry broadly to answer your your point we we've identified the um the kind of left-hand column is those things we need to have done by the transformation actions we need to have done by 2020 there are, for most of them there's a plan about how we are going to get there this just represents the first six months of that plan uh, to demonstrate and, and and make sure we're making the progress and the level of progress we need to in that six months um so yes there is a there is a behind most of these there is a broader plan um uh, but we're just showing the first six months to demonstrate um or to, to make sure that we have achieved what we need to by october next uh, sorry october this year any other comments? 
No, I think it's very, I, I like it. it. It's helpful. It, and the way you've set out the progress, we can at least see if there is progress, which is great. So thank you for that. Um, right, next item Bear with me. is work programme. Okay, thank you. Um, shall I hand over to you, Susan? Yeah, yeah, is that right? Yeah, got, yeah. Um, obviously, there's a number of items um, that are kind of backing up to your June to your June meeting. So currently, you have six items on your June meeting. Um, it is suggested that you might like to consider moving some of them a little bit forward and they they're not time critical however obviously we are very mindful of the committee's um desire to look at school readiness again this municipal year so it would it would still be the existing committee so in in june so we're suggesting that some of the um some of the items are moved to the next municipal year and there's a list so the communications uh, update um the gmfrs communications update and the public sent sector apprenticeship approach update could be taken as written up updates if you are happy with that and um, and then the communications and engagement strategy and the accelerated recruitment uh training uh recruitment training is deferred until july's meeting and it's just checking that you you would be happy with that it's just about trying to do justice to what are incredibly important issues and any comment i'd be comfortable with that any comments at all i think that sounds like a good suggestion and I, I think we need to bear in mind that probably there are going to be very regular updates, not only on fire ser GM fire, fire and rescue service performance, uh, and you know obviously the task and finish group are, have been working with officers, but there will be also um, actions coming out of the previous agenda item as well. So you know your your agenda is going to be more populated than it currently is. Thank you for that. So where are we at? That broadly finishes it. I've got closing remarks. Uh, generally for the committee, obviously, as we go over May and, well, into May, um, potentially people will get reappointed to committees. I would ask, I think it's been a thrilling committee. If you could make it to, known to your leaders ahead of May, if you would like to be on this committee or at, le or at least on any other scrutiny committees, because there is an urgency to get people allotted so we can actually continue. We don't want, we, we were a, a person down last, uh, last May and it's difficult. So if, if, if you are genuinely interested, make it known to your leaders so we can be ahead of that. Uh, and at the close of the meeting, I would like to thank the officers, specifically Susan, who has been fantastic in support of my role. It's a whole new role and I couldn't have done it without her. Uh, and also to Donna, thank you. Um, and the general support from GMC has been superb. Uh, and at that, Close the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Chair, he's not going on to the next meeting days. <laughs> Nathan, is it, has it been decided now that there are always going to be meetings Tuesday at 6 p.m.? Right. So these are just proposed at the moment.